Welcome to the MFR Coaches Podcast, where we talk about how you can create a six-figure MFR practice. I'm your host, Heather Hommel. Not only have I been practicing MFR for 11 years, I'm also a life and business coach, especially for MFR therapists. My goal is for you to understand how to get fully booked, how to talk to your clients, and how to make sure they understand what's possible for them with MFR treatment. I'm here to help you stop under earning, overworking, and burning out. I'll lend support so you can create the MFR practice you've always wanted. Learn how you can do it too, even if you live in a tiny town, and even if you're just starting out, and even if you've ran your practice for years. Let's go. I am so excited to announce that Raise Your Rate Bootcamp is now a course available for purchase. Buy Raise Your Rate Bootcamp and get all five days of the training and coaching, including the 50-page workbook. Get instant access to the course so you can dig right in and learn my exact method for raising your rate as an MFR therapist. Throughout the training, you'll watch me coach MFR therapists on their concerns and their hesitations around raising their rates. You'll watch the transformation as these therapists go from freaked out to ready to announce the change all over the course of five days. And you'll also hear from current and past coaching clients who will share their experiences of what it's like to work with me as their coach. Click on the link in my bio on Instagram or in the show notes here and get access right now. Have your rate raised by this time next week. You can do it too. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the MFR Coaches Podcast. We are going behind the scenes today with my online business manager, Jackie Hayes. Jackie, welcome to the program. How are you? Oh, thank you for having me. I am doing well today. Awesome. Are you ready to get into it to divulge what it's like to work with me and all of our secrets? Yeah, I'm ready. Are you? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. So... Just to give the audience some background information, we've been working together in this capacity with you being the online business manager since October. But before that, originally we spoke in May, I hired you to do a VIP day, which basically meant that we spent eight hours together, something like that. Like it was, a, I had never been on such a long Zoom call in my life. And we basically went over everything to take my business from where it was to the plan for what we've created now. Like that started happening way back in May. Why don't you kind of tell the audience what it is that you do and kind of like the idea behind the VIP days too, because who knows who's listening to this? Like lots of people might need these. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as Heather said, we met first to do a launch planning VIP day way back in May. And those VIP days are not eight hours. They may feel like it, but um, <laughs> I they, also had COVID. So maybe that's why that, that didn't help. I mean, they, you block off eight hours of your day, but we're essentially on Zoom for about five hours, hmm. so like two and a half in the morning and two and a half in the afternoon. And it's intended to really create an intentional launch plan for coaches moving forward with their group coaching programs. A lot of coaches will launch their programs by the seat of their pants Mm -hmm. and throw spaghetti at the wall. And that is fine for their first couple of launches. That works because you don't know what you don't know. And so Mm -hmm. it's a great chance to experiment, find out what works, what doesn't work. And then there's a point at which coaches like Heather are like, I want to be more intentional about this launch so that it feels easier, more spacious. I feel more supported. And that's what these VIP days are really for, is to create launch plans that are not templates, that are not basically what your mentors do, but a launch plan that works for you and your business. And so, yes, we are on Zoom for about five hours mapping it all out. Yeah, it was intense because I don't think I'd ever intentionally thought about my business in the way that you focused my brain to think about it. And so there was this giant intake form I'm so dramatic. You're probably like, oh my God, it was four pages. And and, I mean, it was like everything from like, what are your values? What are your company's values? Um, What are some of the other questions you asked that are like pretty deep? Like it forces you to really think about. Yeah, yeah. So, and it has evolved over time, the more I have worked with coaches. And so what it has now is, yes, it has your values as a company so that your launch is aligned to your values. So everything that we plan does that. Your mission, your vision, your goals, And now I even have things in there like, 
If you are uh, into your human design, okay, what are your human design uh, mm -hmm. elements? If mm -hmm. you're into the Enneagram, what is, what is your Enneagram number? So that we can then look at you as a person and how you work best. Mm -hmm. So that as we're coming up with this launch plan, we are keeping that in mind. Because if you're a reflector, you're going to work differently than if you're, say, a manifesting generator. Or if you're an Enneagram 2, you're going to work differently than an Enneagram 5. For instance, yeah. I'm a Manny Gen, so I have an almost unlimited work capacity as opposed mm -hmm. to say a projector who needs to take some more time off. So yep, I'm a projector. <laughs> yes. So yeah. Yeah. as we're building out a plan, it's really good to know this because you may need to build in more space and openness into your schedule as mm -hmm. a projector than somebody like me who is like, I need all the work. I need to go, 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 which mm -hmm. is also a great way for you to think about who you want to bring on for support. Mm, yeah. You probably don't want to bring on a, another that projector. That must be why we compliment each other so well. Oh, yes. I love this. Okay. So one thing I was going to say is a lot of people listening to this will have no idea what the hell we're even talking about when we talk about the word launch. So yes. in your terms, like how do you describe what a launch is for people that like are not coaches? Yeah. So launching happens in every service and in every industry and in every product. A launch is bringing your offer or your product to your audience so that they can purchase it or consume it in some way. Okay. And that is from the beginning stages of planning what it is your offer or your product is all the way to finishing it up and evaluating how the whole process went. Mm -hmm. So like for MFR therapists that have their businesses or they're thinking about their businesses, like you could essentially be having a launch every day in the way you greet clients, talk about MFR, offer to help and follow through with like the payment processing, like that you're just having little micro launches every yes. client because you're mm -hmm. selling your product that way. Mm -hmm. Or you could have a more bigger launch with leading up to and intentionally creating a new offer or a sale or a special or opening your doors for the very first time or reopening, like whatever, whatever exactly. it is. Doing a price increase could be kind of considered a launch, like all of those things are little launches. Yes. I like to think about it as I'm creating demand ahead of time and I have a line of people out the door and I just say, okay, the door is open. And then all of the people are coming in. So I like to think about it like that. Cause I think sometimes the word launch can be kind of scary or seem really disconnected from what you're actually doing. And there's such a human component in creating all of this stuff behind the scenes that we're going to get into today that you can get by without thinking about it. But when you think about it very intentionally, things start to work out easier and easier. Yeah. So let's get into this, like this idea of intentional planning and what goes into that. And like, what are your ideas around intentional planning? So for me, a launch has actually four phases. A lot of people focus on just that time period where people are buying from you and you're mm. talking a lot on social media. But for me, it's four phases. You have clarity and strategy. You have connecting and nurturing, and then you have the small window of converting people. So all those people that you have been connecting and nurturing relationships with, then you are getting them turned around into paying clients. And that is a very small piece of the launch process. And then the last part is evaluating. So for intentional planning, that really depends on the person, the MFR therapist or the coach or whoever it happens to be, because it depends on their brain, how their brain works. If they have ADHD, their idea of an intentional plan is going to be very different than somebody who has a neurotypical brain. Mm -hmm. Or if they're on the autism spectrum, all of those things, as well as all those other personality factors. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some people need more intention than other people. Some people need to be, say, 50% proactive in their planning and 50% reactive. So as things are coming in, they're responding to them. Yeah. Other people like myself are more like 80 or 90% proactive and 10 to 20% reactive. That is like 100% accurate. Yes. About you. yes, that's so good. Yes. I need my routines. I need to know what's happening ahead of time. And this uh -huh. is why I do what I do. Yes. So. Yes. I love that. Okay. Let's talk specifically about what it was like back in May when we did the VIP strategy session. We can kind of talk about that, that launch that happened right after that. Because I was like, I already had a lot planned. I was headed into, I think maybe it was my third time selling group at that point. I was still very green. 
was, I wasn't really throwing spaghetti at the wall, but I would say like, it was pretty close to that. Maybe I could give myself a lot of credit, but I'm going to, I was very green. So what was that like your experience of it? Kind of give us, let's start with that. Yeah. So one of the reasons why it worked well with you is because you had launches prior to working with me and the Mm -hmm. VIP days do work better with people who have already launched before because they've had some experience in what worked, what didn't work, and they're moving forward with the lessons that they've learned. Mm -hmm. You go into it green. (laughs) Oh, that's the whole point. Um, If you go into it green, there's a lot of stuff. There's just too many unknowns. And so trying to create an intentional plan with a lot of unknowns can be challenging. It's not impossible, but it's more effective if you've got a couple of of launches under your belt. So you did have quite a bit planned for your launch. You already knew you were going to be doing your Raise Your Rate Bootcamp. You knew the dates of those. You knew when you were going to open enrollment, et cetera. So we were just kind of figuring out what the calendar was going to look like and what all the essential elements that needed to happen so that, say, the day that enrollment opens, you are, oh, wait a minute, I needed to make sure that my sales page was up to date. Mm -hmm. Or when do I need to have emails sent out? How many do I want to send out? When do they need to be written? How do I go about scheduling them? Do I want to pre-schedule them? Mm -hmm. So there was lots of just little tiny elements that we were trying to make sure that all the T's were crossed and the the I's were dotted so that nothing fell behind the wayside. Yeah, it was a lot of like, okay, we know when this is happening. What can we automate? Like, what can we get schedule and have done as far as like deciding how many emails you want to go out? Like, I really prior to that was just kind of, you know, just sending it out when I felt like it or when I had something to say and I didn't want to bother people. And, you know, it's amazing in hindsight, like how well those launches did because I always filled my groups not knowing anything. And I just want to point out like, that's very important when you feel passionate about something or you have an idea about something you want to put out in the world, a way that you can serve people, just serving from where you're at without perfection or the need for it to be perfect, or even like knowing what perfection would look like, just going for it and trying it out. And that's a lot of what I was doing. I was just trying it. And I had not low expectations because I had really high expectations and I had a high, I think, bar set for myself about how I wanted my content to be presented to people. But like, I just went out there and did it without really knowing what I was doing. So I just want to give myself five points for that. Lots of beads in the barf jar. But as I was kind of transitioning into more intentional business building is when I found Jackie, I found her through having the opportunity of having amazing business connections with other people in these masterminds that I've been in. And it it really does come down to in life, you guys, like, who do you know? And who do they know? (laughs) And how can you use your network of people to help you purchase the things that you need, purchase the support that you need, or get answers to questions that you have without waiting around, hoping to figure it out. So I was very afraid to hire you. It felt early. Like I felt like I didn't know enough. I wasn't making enough money. Like I it felt very scary at that point in my business because I I hadn't ever spent that much money on hiring somebody yet. And I didn't know what that meant about. And I also could see that it was just like the first step to like needing more support. And also the other scary thing I think too is the delegation and like letting go of control over things. Because when I think about that, like back in May, I literally wrote, edited, scheduled and sent every single email ever that I went out, I made every single sales page, every single checkout cart, handled any payments that didn't process, reprocess them, every customer service email, plus coached, plus created all of the content. Like that was insane. Yeah. I think after the VIP day, you had hired me for like a little add on to schedule all the emails for that that one launch. Because before that, you had done all of that. And this time around, you're like, I'm going to write them all. But then for like, I took a a Friday morning and scheduled all of the promotional emails for you. So Mm -hmm. I think that was kind of your first opportunity to delegate a step of the launch process or any of your business process to somebody else other than your podcast editing. So yeah, yeah. And the other thing too, I think that was revealed during that time together was the part where I did need a lot of space to rest in between things, right? So we worked that into the launch schedule and like hiring you created more space for that. 
it's still something I'm practicing. I have always been someone that takes naps. I just like work that into my day. So that wasn't a new concept to me, but I would feel guilty about it or ashamed or nervous or, you know, whatever. Like it it was like, I was taking it out of necessity, not out of want to do it. And so like, we were able to kind of change things around and I was able to rest more and enjoy that launch in a different way than I had previously. So I wasn't just totally zapped. And I think that was also the time where we made the decision where I was going to take like three weeks of vacation off after the launch. And I have never done that. Well, and I also think that a lot of people get the messaging that launches are overwhelming. So if their launch is spacious and they have time on their hands, they're like, something must be wrong. Yeah. Because this is supposed to be a time where I'm overburdened and I have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And you've watched me cope with this in future launches, right? So now we've gone through a few more together. Like, okay. Yeah, because after the VIP day, we kind of did consulting calls once a month. So I was yeah. around for the next That's couple right. of launches after that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. So you've seen it all. One of the things that my brain struggles with is now we're so organized, like we're writing the emails and scheduling them a month or more in advance, sometimes eight weeks in advance. We're scheduling whatever content I'm teaching either for free or for paid outside of the launch, like to just anyone can come to it way in advance. And so then when the cart opens or a week prior to it opening, I messaging you and I'm like, do we have this set up? Like, did we send this reminder email? And part of that helps us catch glitches that inevitably are going to come up anyway. But, and then part of that, I think is just my nervous brain. That's like, if you're not working hard during this period, something could go wrong or you forgot to do it because it shouldn't be this easy. So that's something like, that's like an upper limit problem that we're having now. Well, and I think that also what you just mentioned about glitches is coming back to something you said earlier, even if you have a very intentional launch plan or whatever it happens to be for your business, mistakes are still going to happen. Yeah. Glitches are still going to happen. I mean, you're, we're using technology. So sometimes it has nothing to do with what we did. Mm-hmm. And some glitch in the software we're using decided to send out nine emails that we weren't intending to have go out. That definitely happened. Yes. Yeah. And I just, I have a podcast episode that's going to air well before this talking about the idea of dangerous things in your business. And I remember when that mistake happened or the glitch happened and I messaged you and I was kind of like, yes, this happened, but I'm also like just sitting in the part where it's not dangerous. Like this is okay that this happened. I'm not like mad at anybody or mad that it happened. It's like, it's fine. And that's a huge growth curve for me. I think it's a big thing to point out too, that that's available for other people. Like you don't have to be reactionary to everything. Like things are going to happen. You get to decide how you experience it, good or bad. Uh Now, me a year ago would have like, my nervous system would have freaked out. I probably would have yelled at people or like made it other people's faults and like needed a lot of like, I'm sorry, you know, that that happened, you know, or whatever. I can't even imagine like what it would have been like, but none of that was happening for me. And I felt like that was such a huge measure of like the growth I've done emotionally and mentally. (laughs) And the part where like this business is like just getting bigger and bigger and little micro mistakes like this are going to happen. And and they're kind of like happening like a lot right now because we're doing a lot and it's also okay. Yeah. I just think that's so massive because like it would not have been okay before. (laughs) It's that uh, question that you hear often in the coaching world, which is what if it's not a problem? Yeah. Yeah. Like if you don't make all those little micro things a problem, then you can use your brain power to solve things that actually are problems or create really good content for your clients. that's going to help them help somebody else. So, exactly. okay. So one question I have for you (laughs) is, do you feel like at this point after working together and really reading all of my content, do you feel like you could sell MFR to anyone in any situation? Like how close do you think you are? (laughs) Um, I could sell getting coaching for your MFR business. Yeah. That I could do as far as selling MFR. Like I haven't had the opportunity to sit in on like the overcoming objections yet and watch all of those videos. So that I might struggle with, but I'm definitely, you know, 50, 50 on that one, but I could definitely, yeah, 
you're an MSR therapist. Trust me. I've been like looking for all the ones in Iowa and I'm like, are you getting coached by Heather? <laughs> That's right. Here from now I'll interview you and I'll be like, do you know how to sell MFR yet? <laughs> And I'll, yeah, a year from now, six months from now, I'll be like, yes, I can do that. Like, I can totally do this. That's so funny. Okay, just random side question. What do you think the biggest challenge has been in working inside my business or working with me? <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm struggling on this one because I don't usually take on retainer clients as an OBM. I focus almost specifically on short-term or VIP day contracts. When I had a spot open up, I immediately contacted you. I was like, I want to continue working with Heather and in a more supportive capacity. So challenging uh, is hard for me to think of. Or if you can't find something challenging, like what was it about either working with me specifically or working with my business, the way we have it set up that you wanted to like actually offer more hours to me when that's not something that you typically do? I think one of the reasons for that one is because while we think very differently, like you said, you're a projector, I'm a manager, and there's all kinds of other things about us and how we think and how we function that are not extreme opposites, but very different. You still have a respect for what planning and being intentional and thinking ahead can do for your business. There are a lot of coaches and this works for them but they're very much fly by the seat of their pants. Tomorrow, I'm going to change everything. And I mean everything. And that works for them and that works for their business model. But it, that is not how I work. Mm -hmm. And I would not do very well working with somebody who is like constantly changing things up and just flying by the seat of their pants and having no plan. Although I don't know how their team functions that way because it's very hard to delegate to people if you don't know from day to day what you're doing. So, yeah. And that creates, a, I think, a very stressful environment, especially if you're bringing on people who are good at implementing and good at strategy and good at planning. Mm -hmm. That is way outside their comfort zone. And so you're, you're kind of probably <laughs> triggering their nervous system on a daily basis. Yes. Yeah. I remember when we first met and you described yourself, like, I don't know what we were talking about, but you said something like, Oh, one time I had to describe myself as a piece of furniture and I described myself as a filing cabinet. And I was like, I think I'm in love. <laughs> <laughs> a filing cabinet that is an alphabetical order with color coded yes. folders. Yes. So, because yeah. I am not like that. Like if you saw my desk right now, you would probably be like, Heather, go to your room. <laughs> hey, I'm in a timeout. But I, as someone who is not, I think I can present as very organized, right? I am very organized in the fact like I can get things done when they need to be done. Like I don't drag my feet, whatever, but I can definitely appreciate someone who can color code and that means something to you and you can file it away and understand where it goes. Like I end at like the content creation. I just want to be able to create content, create the tools that my students need so that they can go out and make their businesses even better. And you help me do that because you have this other skill set that I just don't possess. And then I don't have to spend time feeling bad about not having that skill set or trying to create the skill set. Because I could tell you how many planners I've had, how many grid notebooks and stickers and calendars. And, you know, and we've tried various ways to like help our communication and our organization, right? And it's kind of fun to be able to play with that and see what works. And also to have the ability now to be like, you know what? I don't really like that, but you can use it. And then you just tell me what to do. Right. And, and you're like, okay, okay. No problem. well, and I think too, even as somebody who is the file cabinet with color coding and et cetera, I have gone through or attempted to use probably a good 50 different paper planners and they have never worked for me. So yeah. even as somebody that you would think, oh, paper planners would be great for her. No, they don't work for me. Mm -hmm. And I think for everybody, regardless of what business you're in, you really can't just be like, well, so-and-so said, this is the best productivity tip, or this is the best time management tip and yeah. think it's going to work for you. It all is an experiment and to yeah. find exactly. And you may have to piecemeal it and be like, okay, this one I like, and this one I like, and I'm going to put it together and create what works for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And I promise I will learn how to use ClickUp efficiently for you in some capacity. <laughs> we just, we need to find the capacity that works for you. What, yeah. you know, and that's the thing with 
you find people who shore you up where, you know, it's not your strength and vice versa. But that doesn't mean that you have to know and do, be able to do all the things that your team mm-hmm. members do. Mm-hmm. The whole point of having a team is so that you can take things off of your plate. So yeah. I think a lot of people are like, well, I should be able to do all the things. Right. Well, there comes a point where you just can't. There, yeah. There's too many things and yeah. you're wasting a lot of your brain space where you could be giving that to your clients. Yeah. And that's what's really happening right now in my business. And it's uh, it's an interesting feeling because I have all of the support, right? I have you, I have Colette with the podcast. I have Amber with Entreport. I have Amy, who's my CFO. Like we have this team of people. And at the same time, things are, I don't know if they feel like they're like getting really fast or efficient, like what the word is, but it's it's just interesting how much less I have to be involved in like sending out emails or right. I still create all of that content, but I also have other people's eyes on it so that I'm not doing everything all the time. Yeah. And it's a weird feeling like letting that stuff go. Like I remember when I let you first like schedule the emails. I was like, oh, ugh. <laughs> it does not feel good. Right. Like a lot of it does not feel good. Like as you're handing it over in the same, I went through the same situation with like having Amber build out like the website. Like I had always built my own websites, my own landing pages, my own checkout pages. And to have someone else do that and not actually know how to recreate it is one of the most scariest steps in this business, I think for me. Yeah. But you kind of know how to do it. Like we could figure it out if we had to. That's the other thing that I like about like our relationship. Like we can always troubleshoot whatever comes up and like, you know enough about it. Like you could do it if you had to. And this is where this idea of standard operating procedures, which is a term you introduced me to, I had no idea what the fuck that meant when we, I was like, what, that sounds terrible. Yeah. I don't, what's an SOP. I don't understand. I do not want to write a binder full of standard operating procedures. So can you kind of tell people what that is and why those are important? And, you know, and like, it's something for MFR therapists to start thinking about. Mm -hmm. So An SOP or a standard operating procedure is basically the step-by-step instructions for how to complete a recurring task in your business. And recur, you don't need to write one for something you're only going to do once and never do again. But if it's something that you're going to do once a year, once a month, every day, it's really good to have this step-by-step, this is how it, it should be done. Billing your clients sending them invoices, that would be something you should have an SOP because you're doing that over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. The reason why it is so important to have this is because at some point you may need to delegate and then somebody else can look at those instructions and know exactly how to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And they are literally step-by-step and in multiple forms because everybody learns differently. So a video walkthrough is great, screenshots, and written instructions because you don't know who you're delegating to how they're going to take that in. Mm -hmm. They're really important. And I laugh, I tell the story a lot because this is how I was introduced to why they were important. I used to work at a science museum. And when the new director came in, she said, everybody's got to write SOPs for their work because you never know when you're going to get hit by a bus. Oh gosh. So, (laughs) So we all started doing that. And I discovered this is something I love doing. It's kind of like that peanut butter and jelly, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich Mm, type of thing that you did in school. And then she was a runner and she came in one morning. She always ran at like four 30 in the morning and she came in, she walked in the door and she's like, I got hit by one of the buses today. And we all looked at, and she's like, no, literally one of the public buses clipped me as I, as I was stepping off the curb. Oh my gosh. I got hit by a bus with my SOPs. (laughs) Let's check in and see where you're at. Yeah. Exactly. And in this day and age, I mean, I think of all the people who had to pause their business because they came down with COVID Mm -hmm. and they couldn't move from their couch. Well, if they had a team who was supporting them, their team was able to pick up and, you know, take over those things that normally they weren't doing because there was an SOP in in place. Yeah. So good. And like this just goes into all like the methodical thinking of all of the steps that go in. Like when you sign up for group coaching, we have spent hours literally pouring over what is the experience for the client, for the student that buys that, for the MFR therapist that buys that from the 
confirmation email that you get or the confirmation screen that pops up saying you're in to the email with the next steps on it to the reminder emails for the Zoom calls to how to get into the Facebook group to how to sign up for the private podcast feed that's just available to people in active coaching. Like what else do they get? There's a whole stream of things that we've thought about, right? And then also you've made standard operating procedures or like how-to guides for like, how do you get into the Hello Audio mm-hmm. podcast? Like screenshot, screenshot. Because lo and behold, like somebody, it's inevitable, has trouble either figuring that out, right? Or has trouble getting into the Facebook group or has trouble getting emails to land in their inbox. Like there's all kinds of things that can and do go wrong. Mm-hmm. And we're just like, hurting kittens like into you know or just like come on come with us everybody right and not everybody checks their email at the same time and not everybody is technologically savvy which you don't really have to be to be in my program but like there's some things you have to be able to do like log into Facebook and yep. log into the membership portal how to use the membership portal like all those things so we've had to come up with all of that stuff and then on the back end of that we have to have standard operating procedures for how do you set up an email and send it what are some of the other things we have them for resetting passwords, resending the login for the course portal. I can't think of all of them. There's a lot of them. There's And there's like a ton of automations in Entrepreneur. Like yeah. We have to have a whole separate person working in yeah. the same capacity you do, like in my business, working just with the Entreport. So yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So there's things like, like how to automate an email and how to turn on the sales page. So it redirects the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Those are all things that we have videos and written instructions for so that if something should happen to the person who does Entreport Amber, then you or I can step in and take care of it. Yeah. If it's an emergency situation. Yes. So that's good because it keeps your business functioning when the people that would normally keep it functioning can't be there, Mm -hmm. which is super good. Okay, let's talk more about where my business was when we started and where it is now, like that process of scaling it. Because really what we set into motion in May, we're seeing the fruits of that labor now. What has that been like for you? Like, what are your thoughts about it? It's been really interesting knowing where your brain was when we first worked together in May and what you had envisioned for your business and what your goals were, like the number of people in the group, how much you were charging for the group, payment plans, all of those things. And then watching the evolution of of your brain as we've gone through all of this and where you are now. And then also watching how you respond to launches from then until now, like the number of days that it's been a struggle for you uh, mindset-wise has greatly reduced. You've also started to understand more clearly who are your best fits for the group? You know, like who is getting the most out of it? And so therefore, you know, who it is that you are talking to when you're trying to sell the group coaching program. Can you elaborate more on like what the difference is between how I was functioning when we first started doing this, like where my brain was and what the difference is between where it's at now, like from your perspective? Like, honestly, you were like wanting to crawl on the floor. And <laughs> no, yeah. the first I mean, like I would feel terrible because I think my self-worth was really wrapped up in and dependent on how many people bought. If I hit my goals, I was very dependent on if people were bought in and if they were paying me and if like that meant they liked me and that everything was, I was doing was good. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think that very first launch we did together, there was a lot of that, your brain being a jerk to you type of mm-hmm. conversation throughout that entire week that enrollment was open. Yeah, One of the things I talk to my clients about a lot is that middle of every launch sucks because nobody yeah. does anything. They either buy right at the start or they buy at the end. And so, you know, I watched you struggle there in the middle and now you're starting to like, oh yeah, that's true. I have people who buy at the beginning or I have a couple of people at the very end. And so now that week that the enrollment is open, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, right. These three days are just, let's go about our business to make sure everything's happening, but it's not a big deal. So I think watching you go from, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. This isn't working. This isn't working. Mm -hmm. And when somebody buys, it's a really, really high, high. And it's not that we don't celebrate it now, but there was extremes in that first one of really high highs and really, really lows. Yeah. And it was a lot on my nervous system. And it was really good that I had three weeks off after that one. 
And I think it felt like so much more was at stake because it was the first time we were really, really intentional. So I think in my brain, I was like, I should have this massively different result. And basically what I did was have the same, same result. Nothing had gone wrong. I still like sold out my group. It was fine. I think I'd had like somebody complain and I had someone ask for a refund. Like there was just like a couple of things that happened that were like super triggering because I hadn't yet dealt with them. And now people complaining or people saying this or that, like whatever, like I've got this, I'm good. And I also like, don't take late enrollers. And I don't, you know, there's like a lot of things I've learned from that process that have helped me to, I wouldn't even call it like a thicker skin because I'm still like a very... I think sensitive person. And I think I want to do good. And I want, I want people to like me, like I want to be doing a good job. Right. But I'm just much more able to manage the drama that comes up with it, which is huge. Right. Like that's all we can ask for is like, can I get better at managing this drama? Cause my brain is always going to be a dick. Yeah. And I just tend towards the negative. Like that's just, that's just what I do. It's kind of, kind of it makes me great. You know, I don't know. I think too, in that first launch we did together, yes, the number of enrollees didn't change from the Mm -hmm. other launches that you did, but we looked at other measures of success. Mm -hmm. So other things did change for the positive. And so learning to not just pick one measure for success, but have multiple measures of success is important for any business owner to keep in mind. It was easier, or I had more space in my calendar, or I worked fewer hours, or I had better fit clients, or this one one felt felt fun. That was the huge win. And I don't want to underscore like any of the people in my previous groups because they were all fucking amazing. But in this one, like in that instance, in that screenshot of time or snapshot of time, we got all new people. I think it was all new people. Yeah. If there was returning people, it was a very, very small minority. Yeah. And I, that like freaked me out. (laughs) I think I had this idea, like I've got to have all this proof of concept, like living in the group. What am I going to do? And then I was like, I suddenly switched to like, how is this the best thing for me? And how is this going to make me an even better teacher of this? Because we're all starting like from the beginning then together And that was the most fun. I think I had the most fun in the group. It was the most creation, like creativity I had. And it was super fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I have people from that group that are still enrolling now, like into April of 2023. Mm -hmm. And that was from July. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And at some point, yes, coaching is something you should always have available to you as a business owner, somebody to help you with your brain. Mm -hmm. But At the same time, you are not going to have a 100% attrition rate. So if you are not looking for ways to find new clients and bring new people in, whether it is as an MFR therapist or a coach, eventually you're going to run out of clients. So <laughs> right. if I'm like depending on the same people to enroll and enroll, enroll over and yeah. over again, yeah. we've had that conversation because I have had a high amount of people re-enroll. And I was, I think I was just joking around with my group the other day. And I was like, well, one of these days, you know, like Rob or Sarah or Linda or, you know, or Leslie are going to just not re-enroll one day, you know, cause they'll be done or they're taking a break. And I have to be okay with that. Like now, like starting now. And I am. So like, I just have so much love and respect for everybody that comes to the group. And I am completely detached from whether or not I'm like not attached to if they come back for my self-esteem. And that's been a really big growing yeah. Measure for me. I just love whether they're there or they're not there. It's okay. It's going to be great either way for them and for me and for the people in the group. So we'll make it work. Yeah. Yeah. As business owners, regardless of what your business is, it's hard to detach you as a person from your business. Yeah. So when a client or potential client says no or a client leaves, it is a growth edge there that you have to learn that it's not about you. Yeah. As long as you've been doing your best to serve them, it's not about you. Yeah. And I think this is like really good just for anyone listening who has a businesses, but in particularly my MFR people that are listening, you know, when you have a client that doesn't buy from you again, or they quit treatment prematurely, like before you think that they should, how can you unattach from the outcome of that? Like in any way that makes it mean anything about you 
or you judging the client. Like there is a huge growth edge there. And the more work you do on that, we are working hard on that in this group right now. Ooh, it is painful. It's a painful growth edge for a lot of people, me included. But when you can get to neutral with your clients on whether or not they buy from you again or get what they came for, you will serve your clients in a much more brave way because you aren't dependent on them for how you feel. And when you can be less and less dependent on your clients for whether or not you feel good about yourself, you are going to make a lot more money and you're going to serve a lot more people and you're going to have so much less fear living in your body, which is so important. You just experience your life and the world so differently. The one that I'm working on is that I am responsible for generating revenue and paying my bills. Yes. You're your best referral source. Well, but my clients aren't responsible for that. I can't put it on current clients to be responsible for paying my bills. That's not their job. Yeah. You pay them, right? Like you always are the one paying them. Yeah. I think that's a really good thing to remind yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that creates a healthier relationship with your clients. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it feels, it feels better for everybody involved and you know how to get shit done. Like, you know, how to, like, if you needed to all of a sudden become more financially responsible or had a big, like you would figure it out and you have just like, I would figure it out and I have, and my clients figure it out. But when we remember that about ourselves, like it's super empowering. Yeah. And it really helps with that relationship. Yeah. This is like making me feel a little emotional, like revisiting all this time we've had together because I won't ever have back like that moment in time before I met you. Like I have like my business before and then like that one conversation and and hiring you and like I have my business now and I wouldn't change anything about how I had it up until meeting you, but I'm just so thankful to myself then in May that I had the guts, the courage and the aspiration to be like, yeah, like I'm going to hire this person. And like, I am way too big for my britches right now, but I'm just going to do it. Right. Like I love the tenacity that I had then. And sometimes I like long for her. (laughs) It seems like the bigger the business gets, I have less, maybe, I don't know if that's even true. I don't have less moments of that, but like, I just can instantly transport myself back to that moment in time and those decisions and how good those decisions were to get me to where I'm at. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you for being a part of that. And I'm just looking forward to so many more years of working together. I'm so thankful that you created space in your schedule for retainer clients and that I'm lucky enough to get to be one. I I say this to myself every day, like I'm so lucky to get to be Jackie's client. And I hope my clients have that thought about working with me. Like it's such a great energy to put out in the world. So I hope you know, like how much I appreciate you. Yeah. Anytime that I get a Voxer that is like, we're working together forever. I'm like, well, I'm glad that she likes me enough for that. Yes. Like, forever is a really long staffing. time. I know. <laughs> I would think like your job title would change. <laughs> at some point, there might be some evolution there. At but some yeah. point. Yeah. Well, and like Jackie's at the top of the chain. So like the thing is, is as we hire more people that work in the system to do more of the things, like you will manage all those people. Mm-hmm. So Bring like, you up to serve your clients. Yeah. Which is going to be so great. And I'm looking forward to like building out our team and having the opportunity to be able to do that and to pay people really well. And to, oh, and this is the other thing, like Jackie raised her rate and I love it. (laughs) And I love loving it. And I also love paying you a lot of money. Yeah. Like, I hope you feel like it's a lot. Like I, I, (laughs) what are your thoughts? I, I, well, and I, I gave you like a deadline and you're like, no, I'm going to just start doing it now. I know you had the deadline of like two months from now, but I'm going to do it now. And I'm like, okay. Also that almost made me want to barf asking you Mm -hmm. and telling you this information. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that. But then were you surprised when I was like, oh, like, can we just like start it now? No, not at all. No, I wasn't surprised. It was more along the lines of like, I figured, you know, you, you hadn't planned for it yet. So I was giving you a lead way in your financial planning is what I was basically doing, but it did not surprise me because I knew you had expressed that you wanted to pay me more. And so I was Mm -hmm. like, yay. And no, I'm not also not surprised. Yeah. I was like, gosh, let me pay you more. Do I need to hold you down? Like what needs to happen? Right. But see, but there's also where my brain was going. Here was a person who said that she's been wanting to pay me more. And when I went to her and asked for more, I was still Mm -hmm. nervous and still second guessing myself. Yeah. 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 And and it wasn't even that you were asking, you were telling me your prices were changing. Right. And there's a difference there. Yeah. 
this is true. Yeah, I wasn't asking. <laughs> no, was yeah, like, there's a difference yeah. there. Because I think if you ask all day, like no one wants to pay more, right? Do you want the $2 steak or the $20 steak if they're exactly the same? Like I'll have the $2 one, right? Exactly. But there's this thing about, I don't know, like I don't want to be the person that has the cheapest labor working for me. Like I want people that are in my world to feel really taken care of and also like that they're getting everything that they want. And we won't always match up on what that means, but like right now we definitely are. And it feels really good. It's like a really good experience. And I think it's good to have those experiences. And this is the same for all MFR therapists that are out there ready to raise your rate. There are people out there that are rooting for you that want to pay you more and you're making it fucking awkward for them when you don't charge a better rate or when you leave it up to them to pay you or whatever. I hate all of that. Like, just tell me what you want to get paid or you ask for a tip. Oh, I hate tipping. Cause I don't know. I can't do math. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. you're my massage therapist or my hairstylist or whatever it is. Yeah. You get to set your rate. Yeah. So set the rate for what you want it to be. Don't set it low and then expect the 20% tip. Cause then that's going to build in resentment. If you don't get the 20% tip, the person is like, I don't want to do the math. Just tell me, <laughs> tell me how much I don't want to do the math. Yeah. Yeah. Like I go to this one place and like every time she's always like, okay, it's $60. And she turns around the, her cell phone. And like, I have to type in the total. I hate that. It's, I don't know. Oh, it doesn't even give you like the 15, 10 and 20% options. Oh, that makes it even worse. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) I'm like to the point where like, I'm not even going there anymore. That's how much it bothers me. It's like, just set your rate and like, make it easy. Don't make the client do all this emotional heavy lifting for you because you're insecure about charging a rate, right? It's okay to be afraid. Like you were afraid and you were nervous. And I just raised my rate from 3000 to $5,000. And, you know, I had thoughts about it, right? Like, oh, I think Mm -hmm. I am. Oh, like I went through the whole thing. But it's like in order to expand the capacity to serve at the level I want to serve, I need to be able to pay everybody that works Mm -hmm. for me, right? And I want to make a lot of money. And I will not pretend I don't (laughs) or justify it in any sort of way. So... I just want people to know like it's safe to have those thoughts and those feelings and to like want money and to figure out how to create that money in your life and to tell people what they should pay you, what you want to be paid because 100% of your clients will pay your rate. Mm -hmm. When you spend time thinking about clients that are not yours, those are the people not paying your rate. Stop it. And I know a lot of people, and I'm going to guess a lot of your clients because they're in a field where they're healers, there's some guilt about charging money for helping people heal. The thing is, the more money you make, the more in service you can be to the world. Yeah. Because you can give back that money to hiring good, higher than living wage and donating or scholarships to a seminar or whatever you want to do. But the more money that you are generating, the more you can be of service to people. Right. More money just makes you more of who you are and gives you another tool to serve the world. It doesn't make you bad. It actually just makes you, I don't know, super empowered. It's a good resource to have. And I don't know, I could go on and on about money. We'll have to talk about this more on another episode, I think. (laughs) Oh, yeah, you go on a total tangent. Squirrel, squirrel, (laughs) squirrel. That's another funny thing. Like when we first started working together, I was like, my brain is like a squirrel. Like I will start talking to you about something. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, and then there's this thing that I want to do, right? I kind of do that all the time. And Jackie is the best at setting agendas for meetings and keeping you on task and also letting you squirrel a little bit. Like you're never like, Heather, don't give us any more ideas, right? You're just like, mm-hmm. yes, I'll write that down. Go ahead and let's bring it back. <laughs> yeah. I would never be able to bring myself back like that. So that's just such a good skill that you bring to the table. And then when it's the three of us, you, me, and Amber with Entreport, like her and I are very... <laughs> Similar, like we can both like, we'll just go do this really quick while we're thinking about it. And you're just like, you just heard us like kittens, like you're just gently bringing us in. Right. And we get, we get through through those meetings so fast, which saves so, so many hours. At times you were telling me, it's like, I would look at the calendar. I'm like, you had an hour long meeting and you're like, no, we're two and a half hours in. We're still going. And I'm like, okay, I'm joining these meetings. They're not going to be two and a half hours long. Yeah. And they're not, they're like an hour. We have things to do. 
They're yep. like an hour and like, then you just send me like a review of what we went over and like, and these are what you need to do. Right. And it's so easy for, it makes it so easy for me. It's like, it's the most luxurious thing that I have in my business is having you because I just told you one day, I was like, can you just like on Fridays and Mondays, send me an email and tell me what to do. And you're like, absolutely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to hear that is, that is exactly my intention with what I do is to make it luxurious and useful for my clients. So I'm glad mm. that that's the case. It is the case. And I'm learning for that to be an okay feeling for it to feel luxurious, right? Because in the beginning, it feels a little bad. Like, oh, I'm probably doing something wrong. This is very dangerous, <laughs> but I'm getting used to it sometimes to the point where I'm like, I probably shouldn't ask Jackie to do that. <laughs> I, well, here's the thing. You should know Jackie will tell you no if it's, that's <laughs> it's true. not in my of work. I do this, have semi good boundaries. This is true. This is true. I was like, no, I've stopped myself a few times. <laughs> I'm like, Heather, you're getting out of control. So <laughs> oh, so funny. All right. Well, I appreciate you being here. Where can people find you if they want to scope you out and consume some of your content and get to know you better? Probably where I show up most days, which is on Instagram, and that is Jackie Hayes underscore OBM, and there's no E in the Jackie, or they can go to my website at JackieHayes.me. Okay. And then do you have a podcast? I do have a podcast. It's called Here's What I Learned. Heather it does have an episode on there. So if you want to check out the episode with Heather, it's Here's What I Learned, and it's on all the streaming, Okay, um, whatever those are things are called. So. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So when you guys get emails from me, just know they came from Jackie. So if something's wrong with them. It's her fault. <laughs> it's not. There's like a three-step process now with it when it it's, comes to emails. <laughs> I know it's that. Just know when an email comes to you, you really should read it because a lot of time and care went into delivering that to you to make sure it landed in your inbox. It didn't just get there by happenstance or whatever, whatever that means. It wasn't a five minute, it just came out of Heather's brain and, and yes, it was carefully curated and selected, especially for you. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. We're nuts. Okay. There's lots of time spent looking for memes and gifts. So just so there's you know. a lot of time that goes into those memes and gifts. Yeah. And I'm always telling Jackie that I think I'm hilarious. So <laughs> that's, we're always like laughing so hard when we're putting those together. And it's yes. a fun team effort to do those. So. Yes, we thankfully have the same sense of humor when it comes to gifts. So. We, do. we do, we do. All right, Jackie, thanks for joining us today. And for everyone else, I'll see you or I'll be in your ear next week on another episode of the MFR Coaches Podcast. Bye. Thanks for joining me today. My goal is to help all MFR therapists stop under earning and burning out. I have several resources available for you. Read my book, The MFR Coach's Guide to Having Your Own MFR Business, available on Amazon and at Advanced John Barnes MFR Seminars. Keep listening to the podcast. I'll always have fresh content each and every week. Join my group coaching program. Enrollment opens four times per year. We take all the information I teach and lay down the foundation for your six-figure MFR business. It's more than just raising rates, but you'll make that the hardest part. Then expand into the business owner who delivers your rate like it's just the news and who can sell MFR to anyone in any situation. I'll show you how. Get on my email list, follow me on social media at The MFR Coach, and visit my website for more information on group enrollment, themfrcoach.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week.